Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you are used to being celebrities, and once again today we have a photographer. Here is Keegan, who is kindly taking pictures of data science classes for the Data Science Education Initiative. Everyone who has been emailing me saying, is there going to be a major? When is there going to be a minor? Uh, it's work of people like Keegan that keeps all that moving. So Keegan is going to take photographs of our class. And uh, you can, without embarrassment, say, you know, don't take my picture. And if you don't want your picture taken, just raise your hand. Uh, Keegan has, pardon the pun, a photographic memory. He will crop you out of the picture. Uh, no embarrassment. There's one. No, that's a high. That's not a don't take my picture. Okay, the students are very enthusiastic here. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, Keegan, looks like it's ready to go. Oh, there's one. Okay. Um, one is easy to remember. Okay, good. All right. Um, so um, the goal, and you know, we're finishing up. We're finishing up. And uh, today's lecture is to get you started on something that kind of hung in the air uh, when we were doing classification but never got articulated. You know, the classification that you've done, and you turned in your project yesterday, and you are experts at this. If we give you a data set, uh, and in that data set, all the classes are already available. Then you know how to sort out the two data, the data set into a training set and a test set and develop a classifier. And you can assess the accuracy of your classifier because the classes of the test set are already known. That's great. That tells you whether you have a decent classifier. But the point of this is to classify something new. Something for whose class you don't know. And at that point, what you have is a prediction. You don't actually know whether you've got it right or wrong. Yeah. But eventually, you will know for that person whether you've got it right or wrong. And then suddenly, you have a new data point. Because once you know what that person's actual class was, your prediction goes out the window. Nobody cares. You have the attributes, and you have the, the class. And now what you have done is you have gotten additional data to add to your training set. And this keeps happening. As new people come in, you wait a while, and you figure out what their actual result is. Your new data keep coming in. And what do you have to do? You have to update your prediction. You have to take into account the new information that comes in. And there are uh, quite a lot of issues to consider when you're doing that. And today's lecture is going to be the very first baby step in that process, which I hope you will follow by continuing on with further classes in this field. But before that, um, announcements. My favorite announcement of the entire term. <laughs> so we had thought we'd get you guys to solve a couple of problems this week. And then I looked at your faces on Monday, uh, the, the last time we end. Uh, GSIs met on Monday evening with me, and we kind of looked at each other, and we said, eh, whatever. Uh, so, so done. Done with assignments. However, I'm teaching stuff, right? So last time, we had uh, a discussion of causality, and today, we're going to have a discussion of updating your prediction based on new data, and therefore, we will post some practice problems. They're not due. We suggest you do them, but you're all grown ups. You can decide what you do and what you don't do, right? OK, so today and Thursday, uh, today and tomorrow, there is a lab. And at the beginning, there will be some lab work on the material that you're currently doing, uh, but a small amount. And then what we did was I went through last fall's final exam and extracted the subset of questions that correspond to this term's material. So last time, last time we did some things quite di a little differently. So I took out the ones that you can't really do as asked. Uh, so there's a subset that's available for you. And uh, I think either the entire subset or part of that will be uh, the rest of today's lab. Uh, and then uh, next week, there will be more a review. And exactly what will happen next week, I will discuss on Friday. OK? Um, for your own scheduling purposes, uh, 
I will be here doing review uh, on Monday and Wednesday of next week. Uh, those lectures will not be course captured. They're done at the end of this week. Um, that's uh, totally optional. You come or not. Um, all right. Uh, so those are announcements. Are there any uh, administrative, bureaucratic, technical questions before we get going? Yes. I can't hear you. Oh, the question is the homework that we assigned for Saturday that uh, we are not assigning anymore, will we make that available to uh, What we're doing is we're just throwing that in to the list of practice problems. All right, so it won't be something separate. It'll just be th thrown in to the practice. Uh, more questions? Yes? Regrades for project two is the same, project three, there'll be some note that will go out. Right, project three just came in yesterday. Well, project two was graded yesterday. Or I got, I got mine the week okay. after. Yes, yes, the answer is yes. Project three, I think we're kind of a little bit on your own here, yes. Are we always going to have access to the textbook and the previous labs, like even after we like, uh, are done with the class? Ah, good question. Are you gonna have access to the textbook and previous labs after you are done with the class? You know, I actually don't know the answer to that, probably. Uh, mm, we change it every year, every semester. I'm gonna try and keep this textbook up. As for the assignments, maybe, maybe not. I don't know yet. It will depend on what John De Niro wants to do. Um, shoot him an email. More questions? The textbook I'm gonna try, because I'm teaching, uh, uh, several of us are now teaching a class that has data eight as a prereq, and so we'd like those materials available for students taking that class, so if that all disappears, it's hard for them. Um, more. Okay, so what I wanna do is remind you of the K nearest neighbor classifier, and there is an idea in that classifier that is going to kind of dominate uh, what we do today. Um, so it says, you, you've got your new point, and imagine that colored in red, and around it are K nearest neighbors, and we've colored them blue and gold. Those are the ones whose classes we already know. We've colored them blue and gold. You take the K nearest blue and gold points, and then you do a majority vote. And so basically you're assigning the class of the new point. In your head you're thinking kind of it's more likely than not to be this one. That's what you're thinking. And so I want you to keep in your head that phrase, more likely than not, because that's gonna determine how we develop the method of updating predictions that we are going to talk about today. Um, and just to remind you uh, of the issue here, um, Let's go to, I have so many functions that I have defined. Your entire classification thing. Um, why don't we run everything above? It's busy defining functions. There's the wine table. Um, and I am going to look, there are any number of uh, attributes. I'm just gonna look at two. Ash and flavonoids and the wines are of class one that is blue and class uh, uh, zero that is gold. So take a look at that. And if you're going to do a one nearest neighbor classifier, if you could look at those points, and see where you are going to make the mistakes. Just a one nearest, the absolute, the closest point you're gonna take, and uh, that's gonna determine your color. So I'm gonna put down a new point somewhere, you're gonna take the closest point. For which kinds of points are you going to make a mistake? Talk to your neighbor.
All right, so, so any, any general parameters for uh, what kind of point you're going to make a mistake for, if it's a one nearest neighbor classifier? Anybody? How about from the back somewhere? <laughs> the people in the back are really startled because all the answers always come from, yes, thank you. Yeah, up here is the worry, yes? Up here the worry is that you might have a gold point whose nearest neighbor is blue, or you might have a blue point whose nearest neighbor is gold. Is the place that the overlap that is the most worrying. And so now, how does, say, three nearest neighbors uh, maybe give us a better shot at getting something right? So we take this uh, we take this point right here, uh, that gold one there. If I just took its nearest neighbor, it would be blue, I think. It would be this one. Yep. Uh, but just pretending that it's a new point. Of course, in, in this particular set, its nearest neighbor is itself. But if it's a new point, then its nearest neighbor would be blue. But if I take the three nearest neighbors, then I think it's and think of this as a new point, then I think the three nearest neighbors might be this one, this one, and this one. And I would still get it wrong. Right, because the majority is wrong. However, um, if I take a blue point that is in the overlap, right, then uh, the majority is blue, and I would do fine. So, the kind of point for which I am going to make a mistake is essentially a point that is somewhat isolated in its color. Yes. All around it is kind of the other color, right? And the wonderful thing about isolated points is that they are isolated, and therefore there aren't that many of them. So if you take K nearest neighbor classifiers, your problems are going to be those isolated points, but the hope is that as a percent, there aren't that many problems. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to try and run our classifier. And so this is exactly the same classifier that we had before. We're going to run, um, OK, so uh, I have my big table. What I'm doing here is I'm just selecting these two variables and the class. You know what I'm doing here. I am shuffling. And then I'm getting a training set of half of them and a test set of the other half. All OK with that? Yes? OK, so I run that. And now we are just going to evaluate the accuracy. And I'm going to, ev for this particular training and test set, I'm going to evaluate the accuracy of the one nearest neighbor classifier. And that's 83%. It's not bad. It's not bad. You've got some overlap, but it's not bad. And what's interesting to see is if three actually does better. It might not. Ah, it does exactly the same for this particular set. Uh, run it again. Mm. Same data set, a little bit better. Um, if you keep playing this game, and I'll leave you the notebook to play with, if you keep playing this game, you can see that typically for this data set, the three does better than the one, right? It's just because you have, uh, it, it depends on whether the test set picks up a lot of isolated points or uh, test set picks them up in clumps. Um, so what I'd like to do now is I would like to keep in our head this idea that a majority vote might actually be better. So we're going to, um, I'm going to give you some data, and you are going to do some classification. And the data are going to be much, much simpler than all the complicated data that you have seen thus far. Um, so I'm going to give you some data, and I'm going to give you a point, And your job is to classify that point as A or B depending on which class you think is more likely than not. All clear? OK. And this is a game that you can play essentially without any computer at all. Uh, and to easy round first. OK, so here's the data I'm giving you. There's a class, and it has 60% second years and 40% third year students. So it's entirely sophomores and juniors. Um, among the second years, half of the people have declared their major, but it's a different percent among the third years. Among the third years, a higher percent have declared their major. This should not come as a surprise. That's what normally happens. Okay, so now 
the next part is the part that people gloss over, but you having come through a data science class, that is the part that you're going to write in blood somewhere. The assumption of randomness. You pick one student at random. Those are the data I'm giving you, and that last line is as important as the line with the numbers, perhaps more so. Right. So, classification game. Go. What's, what's your criterion? More likely than not. Talk to your friends. Right, ladies and gentlemen, votes for, we should classify as second year. Can I have the hands a little higher, please? Okay. Votes for, we should classify as third year. Votes for, I will not raise my hand under any circumstances, because we all saw it. <laughs> okay, never mind. Uh, <laughs> So there was a subset, a clean subset that said second year. Nobody said third year, and there's a little theorem there. Because those other people, what's your classification? Okay, so we'll play this game again. And uh, here is my experience over decades of teaching. The people are terribly embarrassed about raising their hand because they worry about what other people will think if they raise their hand for the wrong choice. Let me get rid of this worry. Nobody will think any but anything because nobody's looking at you. Right? That's the issue. Right? I am certainly not able to tell from a big class who is raising their hand. And honestly, it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter to your neighbor. But it clearly matters to you a lot. So we play the game again. Right? Same question. On whatever device you have or on a notebook, please write down second year or third year. Just do that. You don't have to be public about it. Just write down second year or third year. Come on. I'm going to give you exactly five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right. Yes. Somebody actually holds up his sheet. I like it. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Yeah. So. Uh, it's difficult to, to realize this, but really nobody's looking at you. Okay. Uh, so there were a majority, since I'm going with majorities today, there was actually a majority that voted for second year. I think I'm just handing you the student. I'm asking you to classify. I've given you a whole bunch of smoke. I'm giving you a bunch of stuff about whether they've declared or not declared their majors, but who cares? You're just trying to see, are they second year or first year? What percent are second year? 60%, yes? So why do you think that's more likely than not? And not just because 60% is greater than 50%. Everybody knows that. What is on this page, on this screen, that is telling you that that is what you should pick? There's a 60%, but yes, because I picked them at random. Because I picked them at random from the population, the chance that they are a sophomore is 60%, and that is an important statement that we will need later on in this lecture. All right, great. So uh, the uh, classification is second year, and there is actually a chance, and the chance is 60%, and you've won this game, but really, this was not really a career opportunity for anybody. So let's play round two, and I'll give you pretty much the same data. So same class, same class, same class. And I'm still going to pick a person at random, but now I'm going to give you a little more information. Okay, so the one thing I want you to notice, this is a very straightforward setting, but what you should keep in mind for generalizing is first I gave you some data, and you made a prediction. And now I'm giving you a little more information. So now there's the question, should you make the same prediction? 
right? And there is a natural issue, so I, I'll ask you, the, it's the same game. You have to classify as second year or third year. And so it's still true that there are more second years than third years. Yep, but what's the thing that gives us pause here? The person has declared the major. Among third years, there is a much bigger proportion that have declared their major. So now there's a balance as to there are fewer third years, but more of them have declared their major, and somehow you have to take both things into account. All agreed? Okay. So um, uh, what uh, we'll do is we have a computer. So uh, that's just check same data, this cell. 60, 40, and the reason I'm asking you to check is last night I went back and forth between the percents, and so I might have done something silly, but I don't think I have. Okay. So one student is picked at random, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a class of students uh, with 100, a class with 100 students that has the right proportions. Okay, so some of them are second year undeclared, some of them are second year declared, and then there's third year undeclared, and look, third year declared is very large. Yep, okay, so uh, what we need to do is get the relation between the year and the declaration of the major, and ladies and gentlemen, our favorite method is pivot. We love pivot, just keep telling yourself that. We love pivot. We are going to pivot. Because it does all the stupid counting for us. There we go. So previously what I told you was this person was picked at random from somewhere in the entire table. There are 100 people in, the sta in that table. All right? Can we just check that the table is, has, is correct? So second years, there are 60 of them. And third year, there are 40 of them. Yes, so that's correct, the 60-40 split. Uh, among the second years, half are declared and half are undeclared. That's correct. Among the third years, I mean, there are 40 of them, one-fifth are undeclared. That's 20%. So this is a correct table. So what we've done is we've uh, created a class that has the right proportions. And now all we have to do is look at this and say the first uh, classification problem was I was going to pick from this entire table, and I was asking you to pick between that and that, and so naturally there are more of this kind. There are 60 of these and 40 of these, so you would pick that kind because you're doing sampling at random. Now what am I doing? I'm telling you that they have declared their major, so what I am doing in probability language is I am restricting your outcome space. Now the game is being played just on this column. You don't care about these at all. Yes? So what happens as you start out on a problem, you know, you have some information up to now, the future is open. The next stage could be any one of anything, right? But as the next data point comes in, you learn something about the future, and that restricts your space. So now you work on that restricted space. And so now on that restricted space, you're just working here, what should your prediction be? You should predict third year, because more than half of them are third years. Yes? And what is the chance that you will be right? Thirty-two percent? Maybe not. You see, you know you're here. Yes? The reason you picked this is because you thought that if I know I'm here, this is more likely than not. Right? So your chance of being correct better be bigger than a half. So you will be right if you get one of these people out of all of these people. And so your chance of being correct is 32 divided by 30 plus 32. You agree? Yes? Because your total is 62 now. That's what you're working with. And that's just above a half. All right? And that's the method that you use for updating whether you are working here today in this lecture or whether you are doing uh, machine learning later on, uh, there are just more complicated ways of using this idea. It's just every time you get some new information, it restricts your outcome space, and now you work on that restricted outcome space, and you keep, just keep, keep doing that. Uh, a good way to visualize this 
is by something that you will, might have seen before. Um, so I'm actually going to take that off so that you can see both the table and why can you not see? Hmm. Okay, so right there, I think, can you see both things on the same screen? Yes? All right, so both of these visualizations partition all your 100 people into four groups. That's the second years who have declared. That's the second years who are undeclared. That's the third years who are declared. That's the third years who are undeclared. Correspondingly, the second years who have declared, the second years who have undeclared, the third years who have declared, and the third years who have undeclared. Just please convince yourself that those two are doing the same partition. Yep. Also, please convince yourself that up here, I created a class of 100 people. Did anybody tell me that the class had 100 people? Nobody told me the class had 100 people, so I could just as well have created a class with 200 people, as long as I maintained the proportions the same, and I would have got exactly the same classifier. Agree? So all that matters is the proportions, right? And so now I think visually you can see very clearly. We took 32 divided by this total. Where's the 32? It's the third year declared. Third year declared 0.4 times 0.8, 0.32. Yes? So no need for creating the population. You can just read it off the proportions. 0.4 times 0.32 is uh, the uh, declared third years. And the total is, well, that plus the 0.6 times 0.5, which is the declared second years. Yes? And so the calculation that we did by creating the population and then doing the counts and then looking at what the proportions were, we could easily have done from this tree as follows. Uh, here's the 0.4 times 0.8. That's our numerator. That's the 32. And then at the bottom, you have the 32 plus the 30. That's right there. And you get exactly the same answer. Yes? Uh, and this is the classic method of updating your prediction based on, so with no information about the major, we had said sophomore. With information about the major, we now say uh, junior. Okay. And this method of updating is at the center of um, updating um, predictions uh, in uh, machine learning and uh, uh, other areas, and there's a lot of language associated with it. Um, so before you knew the information about declared, you had some uh, idea of the probability that this person was a uh, second year or a third year. Those probabilities are called the prior probabilities because they're before you've got your new data. Now, there's always a question as to which is prior and which is post, because it depends on where you're standing, whether you're looking back or looking forward. So at any given moment, there is a past and there is a future. When the next data set comes in, you sort of take a step forward and the past grows. Yes? And so, and then the past keeps growing. And, you know, if you're my age, you have a very long past and a relatively shorter future. And if you're your age, you have a relatively shorter past and a quite long future. Um, but uh, the terminology is for a snapshot at one moment, right? So uh, before you've got information about whether the uh, about the major, you have these two prior probabilities. Where did they come from? They came from the data that I gave you about the class. Those were the two percents. So I gave you point, uh, point 0.6 and therefore also point 0.4. And I told you that the person was sampled at random. And so therefore, you have point 0.6 and point 0.4 as probabilities, not just proportions. OK. These numbers, if the person's a second year, what's, uh, among the second years, what's the proportion that I declared? Those are called likelihoods. If you know the person's year, then what is the uh, probability that they are declared? Those things are called likelihoods. So given that I'm standing with a person of a certain class, what are they going to do next? That's called a likelihood. This is what I call the forwards probabilities. 
right? We're just going forwards along the trees. And these are typically the things that you see already in your data. Um, and the method that we used is called Bayes rule. And what it does is it gets us a posterior probability. That is, we stand here and I tell you that the student is, has declared their major. So now you know that instead of being in any of the four branches, they're either there or there. Yes? They're either in branch one or branch three. That becomes your whole space. <coughs> and so the proportion of that is your denominator. Your whole space is now this or this. Yes? So that total proportion is not 100%. That's, that wasn't your 100 students. That was 62 students. Yes? This is your 0.62 right here. And what you are asking is, what's the chance that the person is a third year, given that they are declared this vertical bar is read as given? Uh, and you're just saying, well, it's the chance that they're here relative to the total chance that they're here or there. And that's why you have this ratio of proportions, and that comes out to be more than a half, and that's why you pick third year. And uh, that probability is called a posterior probability because it is your prediction of w that this person is a third year after you've been given the information about their major. So uh, when you go backwards along the tree, finding probabilities backwards along the tree is when you are restricting the tree to just the few branches that you know you're on, and then finding all probabilities relative to just those. Somebody had a hand up? Right, I'll pause for a second. And you should, all of you should be noticing this is just properties of proportions. Yes, there's nothing really that has happened here. There are probabilities because you're picking a person at random, and I want to talk a little bit about that randomness in just a moment. Uh, but I'll take questions on the method. Yes? Why did you add the two lower proportions? Uh, why did I do the sum here? Um, it's, I'm told that they're declared, right? So they are now no longer one of these 100 people. They're one of these 62 people. That's my first proportion, and that's the second one. So 0 0.3 and 0 0.32. That's what I'm adding. 0 0.3 and 0 0.32. Yes? Yeah. So instead of doing 32 divided by 30 plus 32, I'm doing 0 0.32 divided by 0 0.3 plus 0 0.32. More questions? Yes? Yeah, so uh, the question is, how do you know to compare uh, to calculate probability third year given declared instead of probability second year given declared? Because you could have done the other branch, yes? Uh, because I am in a situation where it's just second year or third year, compute either. The issue is, is it bigger than half or less than half? All right, so had we computed the other one, it would have been 0.49 whatever, right? And we would have said, okay, we'll take third year. Okay, you can make the same decision. Um, more questions? Okay, so what's the big deal here? We have done so many things that are so much more complicated. What's going on here? Uh, so what I would like you to focus on now is that assumption of randomness, and I'm going to do this in a much more interesting setting, I hope, uh, which is you don't really care whether a person is a second year or a third year. You're just going to ask them. Um, however, um, what uh, I would like to do is to do this in the context of uh, a medical test for a disease that is rare in the population, okay? So imagine a large population of individuals, and in that population there is some disease that only four in 1,000 of the population has. Very rare, this disease. There is also a medical test for this disease. Now, uh, Medical tests for disease will return to you a value of positive, that the test thinks that you have the disease, or negative, the test thinks that you don't have the disease. Yep? And so for this, so now I'm asking you to imagine that for this disease, there is a medical test. And what these branches are giving you 
are basically the error rates or the success rates of the test. Could you please look at those four branches? You agree that the person either has a disease or doesn't. And regardless, the test will either return a positive or a negative, and therefore there are four branches. Yes? Two of those branches are bad. Which two are bad? Which two? Is that a good one or a bad one? Good or bad? For, uh, horrible for the person. Right? <laughs> but from the point of view of accuracy, well, at least the test is picking it up correctly. Yes? This is bad. Yes? This is called a false negative. Um, this is bad. This is a false positive. From the patient's perspective, this is sort of a better error, right? Because, you know, the test gives you a bad answer, and then finally somebody comes and tells you, ah, oh, just kidding, April Fool. Uh, <laughs> that's actually bearable. The other one's harder. And this is also a correct answer. And so where are the errors? The errors are here and here. So these two are error rates, yes? And they are different error rates. You can't compute one from the other. And most tests uh, ha have one error rate that's sort of smaller than the other. And this test has a pretty small false positive rate, but uh, slightly larger false negative rate. So you start worrying about the test a little bit. But anyway, those, so this portion, all of this part is just to do with the test. And all of this part is just is to do with the patient. All right? Okay, so now, question to you. I will pick one patient at random and tell you their test result. All right? So I pick one patient at random, and I tell you that patient tested positive. Based on that, can you figure out the chance that the patient has the disease? So I will pick a patient at random, and I'm telling you, I've done that. I've picked a patient at random. The patient has the disease, all right? Uh, sorry, the patient, back up. I've picked a patient at random. This is what happens in real life. The pa the, there's a test, right? And the test result is plus. What I'm asking you is, can you figure out the chance that the person actually has the disease? What will you do? Yeah, you, 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 they could be on one of these four branches, but I've told you that they're here or here. Yes? So your total space is these two branches, and what I want is that they're actually up there. Agreed? So we'll find the chance of this branch relative to the total chance of these two branches, and that's... We're going to do Bayes' rule. The calculation is straightforward. How do you know to do Bayes' rule here? Because I'm giving you the result of the second stage and asking you for the probability of the first one. Yes? Giving you the first stage and asking you for the probabilities of the second one, you can read off the table. There's no work to do. This going backwards in time is what you're trying to do. And so um, that was my calculation. Do you agree or do you not agree? So I'm either there or there. So that's 0 0.004 times 0 0.99. That's right here. And here is 0 0.996, 0 0.005. That's right here. And I want the chance that I'm in the top branch. That's up there. Agreed? OK? Now, the one thing I want you to notice, it's a pretty good test. It has small error rates, all right? The person has gone in. They've been tested. They're positive. And what we are figuring out now is what is the chance that they have the disease? Yes? You want that chance to be high, or do you want that chance to be low? High, the person has tested plus, right? You really want, I'm asking you what is desired, right? If the person, you go in, you've tested, you would like to trust the test, yes? But if you actually work this out, which some people have already done, there's a little issue. Bigger than half or less than half? Less than half. The person has gone. It's a, it's a pretty darn good test. The person's gone in. They've come back with a plus result. And what are we predicting? We're predicting now you don't have the disease. <laughs> there is something very strange about this. right? And it is bears examination. Right. So the first thing I want to do is I just want to create the population with 100,000 patients because you know I have very small proportions, so I have to have people 
So we'll create the population with 100,000 patients. And so I just wrote a function. OK, this function population creates the population with this percent of disease, these people. Yes? And this test. So the test is always constant, so it's not an argument. Right? It's just going to create this population, and it's going to do our counts for us. Yep? OK, so it's creating a population of 100,000 people, and it's giving us our counts. Take a look at that. 100,000 people, yes? Uh, and four in 1,000 have the disease. So total, how many have the disease? Four in 1,000 have the disease. I have 100,000. Four in 1,000 have the disease. I have 100,000 people. 400 have the disease. Yes? Is that correct? Yes, because it's 4 plus 396. 400 have the disease. The remaining don't have the disease. Yes? And now we've broken up according to whether you test positive or negative. And what you're seeing is the effect of the rare disease. Very few people have the disease in the population. So among those, those who test positive is actually comparable to the small per percent that test <coughs> false positive. Right? There's a huge number of people who don't have the disease. There's some tiny proportion of them that test positive by mistake. But the tiny proportion of the huge number becomes comparable to the huge proportion of the tiny number. Yes, the, because the correct positives are 99% huge proportion of a tiny number. The false positives are a tiny proportion of a huge number. And what happens is that those two end up being comparable. So it's almost like a coin toss. And in fact, in this case, we're saying test result positive or not, and you don't have the disease, which is so you kind of want to throw away this test. Yep. Except now this is where you go back and you examine what in your head you are imagining with the model of randomness. Somebody goes in to be tested for the disease. Yes? Is that a person picked at random from the population? When would you go in to be tested for a disease? When you think you might have a chance of having the disease. Yes, you are not somebody who has been just picked as a ticket from the population. So if you do pick a ticket at random from the population and go through this process, then if that person comes out plus, you haven't really learned anything. But that's not who goes in to be tested. The assumption of randomness is important. And so now we get into, well, if you're going to be going in to be tested, you think you kind of maybe have the disease. If your doctor says you should be tested, the doctor thinks, well, maybe we should test this person. Yes, yeah, so they're not thinking of you as a random person. They've done some you know, medical examination, and there's some, uh, there's some, they have in their mind, ah, I should get this person tested. So what we say is what they have in their mind is now a subjective probability that you have the disease. You've gone in to be tested. You think you have the disease. Maybe, maybe you should be tested. The doctor examines you, and they said, ah, let's get a test done, right? So that, ah, let's get a test done is saying, based on what I am seeing, I think that it's worth getting a test done. Right? And so what I'd like you to do now is I would... Um, Um, I'd like you to look at this picture, All right? Notice that the test is exactly the same. I haven't changed the test, yes? I've changed these two numbers, and somewhere make a note that those two numbers are no longer proportions in a population. Because the proportions in the population are still 0.004 and 0.996. Those two numbers are now what I'm pretending is they're the doctor's subjective probability that you have the disease. Right? So the doctor says, eh, 5%. Right? That's bigger than 4 in 1,000, but not very large. Yes? Now, is it bad to have a subjective probability? It isn't. You have subjective probabilities all the time. All the time. 
most events about which you have probabilities, like, you know, what's the probability that my favorite team is going to win a game is a subjective probability. It's not a frequency. They don't play over and over again with that other team and you count what fraction of times they won because by the time you're doing that, they'll have died. <laughs> yes, it's your personal belief in who's going to win that game. It's a subjective probability. And you can calculate with them just like with any other proportions. You just have to remember that the answer that comes out in the end is subjective. So every chance that you see, there's a chance that there's going to be the big one in California within the next 30 years. There's a subjective element. Nobody's watched frequencies of this, right? Because you don't have frequencies for the next few years. So it's fine. You just have to keep that in mind. And so what I'm giving you is the doctor's subjective probabilities are 5% that the person has the disease. Yep. Play the same game. The population now has 5% diseased. Yes, exactly the same game. Look what happened. 5% prior probability of the disease is pretty small, yes? But now you've got a good test. If the test says positive, yes, which one are you going to conclude, disease or not disease? You're going to conclude disease, right? Hugely. And so if we do our calculation, the calculation comes out like this. Yes? If your subjective probability of a disease is even 5%, which is tiny, the post probability that you are diseased, given that you have a plus result, has shot up to 90%. Right? And if you are this person who really doesn't know whether you have the disease or not, and you think, I don't know, maybe I have the disease, I really don't know, my, I think 50 50. If you think 50 50, then you agree that your tree, your tree is that? Yes? You do the same calculation. And if you started out thinking 50-50 and your test result came out positive, then you are really telling yourself, you know, I've got this disease. Right? And the point is not so much the calculation. The calculation is the same thing every time. Right? The point is that one set of this tree are frequencies. These are frequencies. The test, uh, the people who manufacture the test know what fraction of times they get things right and what fraction of times they get things wrong. These are not frequencies. These are degrees of belief. And when people start classifying email messages, this is spam or not, that first step involves somebody's prior belief about certain kinds of messages are spam and certain kinds are not. Right? So if something has Nigerian lottery in it or whatever it is, then that's spam. And if something says, uh, Professor, I forgot to turn in my lab, what can I do? That's probably not spam. Right? But so, so, so there's somebody has a prior belief, and then messages come in, and then based on new information, you have to update that belief. So you start out with a prior subjective belief, and this is a way of showing you, based on frequencies, how you can update that belief. All clear? All right. Here's the plan for Friday. The first thing you should do is you should congratulate yourself. I'm not going to teach anything more new in this class. Uh, on Friday, I have invited a few people who are teaching data science and data science related courses to come and talk to you briefly. I will give a rundown of what the statistics courses look like in the future, what are their contents, right? what do they do, who needs them, uh, briefly. And then what I'd like to do, hopefully in time remaining, is to give a top-down, very broad review of what's the material in this course. And then starting Monday, to get into slightly more detail. Sound like a plan? All right, I will see you on Friday.